my name is Henrik Arnstad and I would like to give a, a lecture upon the subject of the revival of the English longbow, 1776 until 1914, as it was called, the gift of God to the English nation. Uh, we see here a, a picture of, of two archers from uh, 1789, the same year as the French Revolution, and that's no coincidence, I may add. Uh, the Archers by Henry Rayburn uh, is, is shown here, and, and two rather splendid looking young Lentmen shooting the bow, or at least trying to shoot the bow, uh, and that was typical of, of their age, because something happened regarding England and archery in the early 18th century. The beginning of our story begin, uh, starts with, with uh, a Mr. Waring, uh, the unforeseen effects of one Mr. Waring's oppression upon his chest. <laughs> in 1776, a Mr. Waring visited Sir Ashton Lever at Leicester House in, in, in what's today London. Mr. Waring had contracted an oppression upon his chest, arising principally from sitting too closely to his desk and pressing his breast too much against it, and which the most eminent of a faculty had in vain and David to remove what to do, what to do. A resolve to try the effect of a bow in of affording himself relief. Well, Mr. Waring uh, picked up a longbow uh, somehow and started shooting the bow. He accordingly made it a regular exercise and in a short time derived great benefit from the use of it and ascribes his cure, which was perfectly solely to the use of, the, of archery and the bow, the long bow. Now, Sir Ashton was much impressed by this and, and, and also seemed to have found the activity of shooting the long bow as, as uh, very elegant. And uh, so, uh, in 1780, Sir Ashton founded the archery society named Toxophilitis, which is still around today, thus giving birth to the English so-called archery craze, which lasted more or less until 1914 and the, the beginning of the Great War. And this was the, the, the subject of, of my master's thesis uh, a few years ago when I was researched modernity, nationalism, gender and the English longbow. Uh, in my thesis called The Amazon Archers of England, Longbows, Gender and English Nationalism, 1780 to 1845. And, and here we see some rather splendid looking young women shooting the longbow and, and that's a very interesting part of our story. Uh, the, the English longbow, was it an English longbow or was it in fact a Welsh longbow? Well, it was a longbow invented long before there were such things as nations. It's a Stone Age weapon. Back in the Stone Age, people used uh, yew longbows, longbows made of a yew tree, in order to hunt and uh, uh, conduct warfare. For instance, the, the Iceman Ötzi, if you remember Iceman Ötzi, found in the Alps uh, a few years ago, he was armed with a yew longbow. So the longbow itself is, was nothing special to the, to the Englishness or Welshness or, or nationalism or whatever. It was much older than that. But what happened in the 13th century is that the English tactical use of archery warfare changed. The use of a longbow herald, heralded the, infant, the so-called infantry revolution, where infantry became more and more important in, in warfare, and uh, thus the famous English longbow was born since the English made use of it in a very special tactical ways. In the Hundred Years' War, uh, 1337 until 1453 against the French, the English war against the French, English armed forces massed thousands of longbow archers against French knights, ending the dominance of heavy cavalry upon the battlefields of Europe. So it was a tactical invention. The thing was not the bow itself, even though it may have been heavier than before, never mind that. The, the thing was, instead of having a few archers firing volleys at uh, assaulting cavalry or infantry or whatever, <clears throat> the English found out that by instead having 7,000 or 8,000 archers massing down uh, rains of uh, arrows on, on the enemy, something new happened, the so-called infantry revolution. 
uh, ending the dominance of heavy cavalry on the battlefields of Europe, as I said earlier. And this lasted uh, in the English armed forces. The, the longbow was used in English armed forces, both uh, on ground and on sea, uh, until around 1600, when the longbow, uh, longbows of England was replaced by firearms, muskets, and so on and so forth. So the age of a longbow ended on the military battlefield, but the longbow legend prevailed. Uh, the, for instance, via William Shakespeare, his play, uh, The Henry V, uh, regarding the, the Battle of Agincourt, where the longbow was uh, prominent, and also via the legends of Robin Hood, of course. Uh, the legends of Robin Hood had been around for uh, since... 14th century. Uh, he probably lived, if, if he lived, he probably lived somewhere around 1300. Uh, but after the medieval period, the, the myths of Robin Hood took on new appearances. Well, that's one way of putting it. And, and during modernity, after the French Revolution, Robin Hood also became a very important part of English nationalism, as we will return to that quite uh, a lot later on in this lecture. Allons en France de la patrie, le chou de gloire est l'arrivée contre nous de la tyrannie. Well, you have uh, certainly heard La Barcelliese before, the, 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 the song of the French Revolution, from, uh, the national anthem of France, and also uh, expressing the birth of modern nationalism during the late 18th century, following the, the, uh, the French Revolution in 1789. N uh, nationalism, the, the main ideology of a modern nation state. Uh, the rather strange idea that a person can uh, sculpture his identity via the land where he lives. Rather strange uh, thing, but nonetheless very, very, very successful. People fight wars and, and live and die uh, according to notions of nationalism, and that's as strong as it gets regarding ideology. Now, in Britain, national, early, early nationalism during the late 18th century gave birth to explicit nationalistic movements uh, in Britain. Within the state of Britain, different nationalisms occurred. Uh, Great Britain is, is a rather peculiar state since it, uh, it's not a nation state, but it upholds a few different nations, not only via its empire back in the 19th century, but also within the British Isles. Uh, English, Scots, Welsh, and, and Irish. Now, those nationalistic movements that started in, in mostly Scotland, to be honest, mostly Scotland, but also Ireland, Welsh slightly less so, um, it, it was quite explicit and quite obvious um, uh, people wanting their own Scottish nation-state, for instance, as we see here, Mel Gibson portraying Braveheart in the in the movie regarding, uh, which is very much a, a, an, a, an expression of Scottish nationalism. But how about English nationalism? Uh, that was quite a bit harder thing to do because English nationalism during the late 18th century had to be implicit as English supremacy on the British Isles, uh, as uh, the British Isles was more or less, uh, or less an, an English mini-empire, uh, British nationalism couldn't be explicitly com communicated uh, on the British Isles because it risked making people angry, making the Scots angry, making the Irish angry, uh, and, and, and somehow the Welsh more angry as well. As one researcher puts it, when you are securely in charge, it is best not to remind others of this fact too often or too insistent, insistently. This quote is by Krishan Kumar, who's, who wrote in a very, very exciting uh, essay called The Making of English National Identity. Now, hence the rebirth of the English longbow in the late uh, 18th century. Uh, the English longbow fitted perfectly into the notion of English nationalism and English supremacy. Since 
it was nationalism without a flag. Uh, in shooting the longbow, one could express English nationalism being English uh, without uh, overly communicating that I am English. It was more or less implicitly uh, understood. We see here some, some wonderful looking uh, Kent uh, Bowman uh, on, 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 uh, on the uh, image. And you may note that they're wearing uniforms. Both the women and the men were wearing sort of uniforms. They were dressed the same. And also you can already note that there are women there shooting the bow alongside the men. Now, nationalism without a flag. Uh, the 1780s and 1790s, uh, following the, uh, the adventures of Mr. Waring's constructions, constructions, saw the birth of archery societies all over England. Uh, started with dozens and later on became hundreds of archery societies, the, ar the English archery craze. It became almost obligatory for the English elite, the upper classes and the nobility, to shoot the bow. On, on the lawns of English manors and castles and, and so on and so forth, there were archery butts put up everywhere, and, and you were supposed to shoot the longbow there, the English longbow, communicating your Englishness and also your, you belonging to the upper class, of course. Why the longbow? Well, why was it so... Um, that the, the, the Lomba became a symbol of this sort of nationalism. Well, first of all, th these were times of growing military tensions towards revolution in France, erupting in the revolutionary wars and the Napoleonic wars later on. So being traditional a weapon for fighting French people, the English longbow fitted perfectly into that, that sort of uh, martial scenery uh, evolving in the late uh, 18th century. Secondly, uh, notions about English supremacy over Britain uh, towards the British, the so-called Celtic fringe, the Celtic fringe, um, the Celtic uh, people of the Scots and the Irish and the Welsh and so on and so forth, uh, there was a notion of English Anglo-Saxon, anti-Celtic and also anti-Norman, which is a bit stranger, but anyway, it existed there. Uh, so, so that was a sort of emphasis on the Anglo-Saxon heritage of Englishness. Um, and what better way to, to make use of this but via the weapon of Robin Hood, the, the English longbow, which the Anglo-Saxon Robin Hood uses in order to fight the, the Normans uh, invading Britain. Uh, lots of lots of, of stories and discourses coming into this uh, notion of the longbow as, as something typically English or as uh, uh, it, it, it is expressed in 1791 by Thomas Roberts. The bow used by the inhabitants of this island has always been distinguished by the title of the English longbow. Although the English do not claim the merit of its first invention, this uh, is in, uh, refers to the Welsh, uh, that the Welsh claims that they invented the longbow, which they didn't. But anyway, although the English do not claim the merit of its first invention, yet the wonders it has performed in the hands of our ancestors, who we find at a very early period adopted and fostered this their darling weapon, very naturally and significantly annexed their name to it. The bow was the singular gift of God to the English nation. Now, this is quite strong, isn't it? It's, it's very nationalistic and it's very... Um, it, it differs between Englishness and the Celtic fringe, the Celts having invented the, the, the bow, but then it has been uh, used by the English to such success that it is, that it is the English long movement, that the English has annexed their name to this, their darling weapon, the English longbow. So, 1791, quite strong. Now, the interesting thing, and, and one of the th themes of my research, is that the women 
became the women of England. First the elite, the nobility, and later on more and more. And the women were included as archery warriors, as we can see at this rather, um, rather lovely picture um, uh, from, from around 1800. One can always uh, almost see uh, Pride and Justice, uh, Jane, Jane, very much Jane Austen style uh, English women. Don't you agree? And the imagery is plentiful. Uh, we have l hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of images uh, uh, regarding English women shooting the bow. Uh, the women who I call the Amazons of England, and they also called themselves the Amazons of England. There were arch female archery societies set up calling themselves Amazons. Now, during First and foremost, the 19th century, all over Europe, people, nations formed paramilitary organizations of some sort of weekend warriors. But only in England were women allowed to participate actively in these uh, uh, paramilitary organizations, such as archer societies. Uh, this is strange because English women of upper classes were generally almost not allowed to do something at all. They were uh, supposed to sit at home and, and do knitting and maybe painting or playing some sort of musical instrument and wait for Mr. Darcy to uh, enter the, 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 the home and, so, uh, and then they can hopefully get married to Mr. Darcy or, or some other uh, male character. Now, this didn't happen regarding archery. Women, English women entered the new archery societies, learned to organize in these societies, and were generally well respected as archers, even admired as archers by the male archers. And this seems to happen by coincidence back in 1780 when um, the English elite starts to shoot the bow. The, the women, the women comes out to the Lord and, and says, oh, can I grab a bow? Can I try this? Uh, this looks like fun. And nobody stops them. There are some, there are some men does not like this. They, they say, oh, this is not uh, good for a woman to do this sort of activity. But, but generally put, what can I say, that archery in England becomes one of the very, very few, maybe the only place where men and women could participate in activities together. And it became an arena for courtship, it became an arena for, for negotiating marriages and things like that. Uh, so it was it had its own social use. And also, as I earlier said, that <coughs> those feeble artists were well seen upon by the English men. They were perceived as cool cool girls. Wow, they are so cool. And they sort of adapt to a legend of a female archer, sort of with Amaz the Amazons of ancient Greece, uh, uh, Artemis, Apollo, uh, Artemis and Diana of a Roman uh, mythology, Greek and Roman mythology. So there, 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 it, it has a certain story, but and I could go into that for, for an hour easily, but I won't do that. But it's very interesting, in a way, that in England, the, those uh, women who are supposed to be at home and not do anything, uh, they venture outside and start organizing themselves in archer societies. And this has implications. As uh, not the least since the Robin Hood myth, uh, becomes ex uh, more and more important to England. Now, to the left, we see Robin Hood, and, and in the middle, we see little John, his uh, best friend, and to the right, we see Maid Marian, as she was perceived in the 8th, 19th century. Uh, and you see, it's a warrior. Maid Marian is a warrior. Later on, when she's uh, portrayed in movies during the 20th century, movies and popular culture, she's always a, a very... A uh, female character sits and uh, uh, longs for Robin Hood, who's out doing the fighting. But in the 19th century, Maine Marion was still a, was a fighter. She was uh, a very 
good fighter as well. She was even better than Robin Hood at archery at some time. And so uh, those are the days and folks may abuse them. Then women have muscles and knew how to use them, one maid Marion says in a play once around 1900. And that's that's very interesting. Um, the, the, the later feminized maid Marion comes during more or less during the 20th century. Anyway. Ivanhoe, Robin Hood, and the bourgeoisie weekend warriors becomes the center of what happens in the 19th century, the Victorian era. After the end of the Napoleonic Wars, and following the huge success of Sir Walter Scott's novel Ivanhoe, the growing English industrial bourgeoisie, the middle classes, embraced archery because they, 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 they were looking at the upper classes and the nobility and the elites and they were doing archery and said, we want to do archery too, because we're the new, uh, uh, the new backbone of England. And one interesting thing is that Robin Hood ceases to be a nobleman, uh, according to Walter Scott's Ivanhoe, which the, this novel is basically about, about Robin Hood. <clears throat> Uh, Robin Hood uh, was from the beginning a yeoman, a uh, sort of middle class peasant, uh, but around 1600 he was transformed uh, in popular culture into a nobleman, uh, the Earl of Huntingdon, Sir Robin of Loxley. Uh, you may uh, recall uh, this because that has later returned. But but around 1600 it started that Robin Hood, the peasant Robin Hood, uh, suddenly became a, a, a nobleman, uh, an earl, nonetheless. Now, so, so what he got retransformed Robin Hood into a yeoman again, a middle class peasant, uh, celebrating the English middle classes, the, the backbone of Anglo Saxon England. Um, well, well performed, Mr. Yeoman, and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and the middle classes of England loved this. They absolutely loved this. But the national hero of Englishness, the national hero of England, Robin Hood, uh, which differs very much from the national hero of Britishness, which is uh, Lord Nelson and, and uh, King Arthur, I suppose, King of the Britons. They were sort of maritime, uh, they were transnational, they ventured forth, or long, uh, in the word, looking for the Holy Grail or defeating uh, the French uh, fleet at Trafalgar. Uh, but Robin Hood lives in a forest in England. He's far from the sea, far from the ocean, far from his trash national maritime experience of, of uh, Britain, uh, identity of Britain. Uh, so English nationalism is a land-based nationalism. And all of this suited very much the, 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 the sort of English nationalism of the English bourgeoisie and the growing even, even more... Uh, uh, self-confident English middle classes uh, and archery and Robin Hood hysteria turn into a spectacular mass movement. Millions of English men and women organize themselves in archery societies and Robin Hood societies. Uh, one of the biggest Robin Hood societies uh, had half a million members, uh, as I recall it. So Ivanhoe, Robin Hood, and the bourgeoisie weekend warriors made uh, Longbow Archer to 19th century mass movement, the prime uh, symbol of Englishness. Even the young Princess Victoria, soon to become Queen Victoria, embraced archery. Uh, she and her mother visited uh, Hastings, uh, or rather the uh, then newly built St. Leonard by the sea, I think it's called. And uh, the young Victoria, uh, she, I think she was only 15 years old, I'm not sure, but something like that. She joined the St. Leonard's archers in 1834 and became a keen archer herself and her later husband, uh, became an archer as well, and, and they practiced archery because they were, of course, English, as well as British and emperors of, of uh, 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 an, um, uh, having an empire, a global empire. So the Englishness was also important for, for, for Victoria, and this was bene manifested via, of course, the longbow. Uh, I visited the, the Hastings Museum and found wonderful material uh, re remembering uh, 
the time when, when the British royal court was uh, a part of St. Leonard's, uh, Royal St. Leonard's Archery Society, and, and uh, there were treasures there that, that I have to tell you about some other time. Now, today we don't, we don't think of longbow archery as the prime uh, identitarian object of English nationalism, of course. So what happened? Well, tennis happened, <laughs> of course. You heard of Wimbledon. Uh, during the 1860s and 1870s, uh, tennis and croquet uh, became, began to compete with archery uh, in popularity in England. Archery had been around then for about 100 years and, and maybe it was time for something new and exciting. Still, the English mass archery movement continued until 1914, I would say, the, the beginning of the Great War, and then more or less vanished. But the legacy remains. Uh, one thing is that the daughters and granddaughters of the Amazon archers of England became suffragettes. Uh, the, the, the mothers and grandmothers had learned to organize via archery, and the, the suffragette movement could use this feministic uh, skill of organizing. Don't mourn, organize, as Joe Hill once said to become suffragettes and, and propagate uh, vote for women. And Robin Hood carried on. Robin Hood became uh, Robin Hood who had until around 1800 I would say that Robin Hood has been a, a more, an, more mostly English uh, celebrity. He became an international celebrity uh, most famously in the face of, of Errol Flynn in the shape of Errol Flynn in, in the 1938 I think movie uh, The Adventures of Robin Hood Lovely movie, wonderful movie, uh, but Errol Flynn is remade into an English American, uh, which is quite uh, interesting, suppose, uh, considering that he's the English national hero. So uh, the longbow ventured on, and I would say that during the 1990s, maybe in connection with a sort of the movement that resulted in Brexit and things like that, I would say that the, the longbow has uh, has a modern renaissance today as well. I myself shoot the longbow, the English longbow, with uh, the Fraternity of St. George, uh, founded by Henry VIII in, in 1509, I believe. Uh, I have the insignias here, as you may have noticed if, you, if you're into noticing things. Now, conclusions. Uh, well, one might say that the birth of English aristocratic archery societies, the birth of the Renaissance of the English longbow in the 1780s, used the history of medieval archery warfare in order to produce a suitable form of English nationalism. So, in the Hundred Years' War of the 1300s and 1400s, there was uh, a medieval form of English nationalism conveyed via the, the, the longbow. And this quite seeming, seamlessly adapted itself to uh, English modern nationalism in, at the late uh, 18th century. That's one way of putting it. And later on, during the golden age of the global British Empire in the 19th century, the English enjoyed privileges on the British Isles towards other nationalities, such as Scots, for, for first and foremost Scots and Irishmen, and, but also the Welsh, the, the Celtic fringe. Now, English superiority was at the heart of the longbow shooting English elites, but they did not want to disturb British cooperation, since they were expecting in the late uh, 18th century wars with France, new wars with France, and the, uh, they had it, uh, they had it coming. Um, during uh, when the Napoleonic Wars ended in 1815, right? So uh, I think so. Uh, so uh, it was wise to have some sort of English nationalism that didn't wave a flag telling everybody around itself that we're better than you are, you Celtic, Scots, and so on and so forth. Uh, during the 19th century, after the Napoleonic Wars, longbow archery becomes a huge uh, thing in England. Uh, 
uh, as the confident industrialized English middle class took, takes up archery and becomes some sort of weakened warriors, Robin Hoods and Maid Marians, so on and so forth. The English longbow functioned extremely well during this entire period from, uh, from 1776 until uh, 1914 as an object symbolizing English nationalism without waving a flag. And there you have it. Uh, thank you very much for listening to my lecture. And good luck doing archery. Mm -hmm.